All right. Hi, everybody. We're go coming in today for our video on the Texas Revolution. So I wanted to go ahead and get this video done. As again, things always come up. So we'll go ahead and just, I guess, start here. I don't think much more mention is really needed. So for today, we're going to cover the Texas Revolution. This was a topic I mentioned a couple, about two weeks ago I wanted to cover, so I wanted to go ahead and get this out of the way before we kind of move on here, as this was an event that happened during the time frame of Andrew Jackson's presidency, but did not really immediately directly affect that presidency. It wasn't until Martin Van Buren that it really began, the question of Texas really began to dominate American politics in a way, along with other issues such as the slavery issue. So to, what I want to discuss today is, of course, the Texas Revolution, and this is might come as a surprise to many people that Texas, for a period of roughly about 10 years, was actually its own independent country. Most people do not realize this. Most people do not realize that the state of Texas was once a nation on its own for a period of 10 years. Mex Texas gained independence from Mexico, and then after 10 years, officially kind of garnered enough support in the United States to get the United States to annex it, or officially just kind of take it in as part of the nation and join the United States, which of course didn't go too well with Mexico, but we'll get to that later. So to start here, we need to first discuss a little bit of the background. So, in regards to the Texas Revolution, you really we have to go back to 1821, and of course, this is significant not so much for Texas, but because of the power that controlled it. Until eight, prior to 1821, Mexico was still a Spanish colony, and during the late later half of the 1810s, a revolution took place in Mexico that officially overthrew Spanish rule and established the new Republic of Mexico. So in 1821, the Mexican War of Independence officially comes to an end, and Mexico officially is granted its independence from Spain. Mexico is officially a new nation. It inherits most of the Spanish lands in North and Central America that are left, at least, except for like the Caribbean islands, like such as Cuba, for example. Now, Mexico wanted to gain control over its northern regions in what is now the western United States. Now, you might ask, why was this? And this was because during the Spanish times, the Spanish had largely kind of left these regions in a way you could term it as wild. They really didn't settle too much in the northern regions of what we would, states and areas what we would now know as Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, Nevada, Utah, Texas. They really didn't settle these areas. They set up missions, yes, to try to convert the local Native Americans to Catholic Christianity. But other than this, they really didn't establish big old town-wide or city-wide settlements. Now, the one exception to this rule would be California. The Spanish were fairly active on the California Pacific coast. But other than that, they largely left the inner part of the state going toward the Nevada border as just kind of wilderness. So Mexico, upon inheriting these lands from the Spanish, kind of wants to take a different path than what Spain had done and officially start to populate these lands and to gain control of them because the Native Americans who had been causing trouble for the Sp with the Spanish for years in these territories, although the regime may have changed, they didn't stop causing trouble for the regime. The Native Americans still were harassing settlers in these regions under Mexican rule. So Mexico wants to gain control over the more direct control over these territories, and they deem that the best way to do this is to move people in them. And in order to do this, they the other reason that they also kind of had wanted to, my I mentioned for the Spanish, they didn't the Spanish really didn't populate these northern areas because one other reason, and that was because of they viewed it as a British and French buffer zone. The British colonies had traditionally been up on the east coast of the North America, and the French colonies of what had once been French Louisiana, of course, had been on the Mississippi River. And the Spanish kind of thought that this big, wild, empty space on the north would be kind of like this big old buffer that if in the event that either Britain or France had chose to invade Spanish Mexico, they would have to go through this wilderness of basically no settlements, 
possibly starve to death, die of starvation, die of thirst, die of Native American attacks, that by the time they actually got to the settled communities down south, they wouldn't be in any fighting condition. So they kind of viewed keeping the Northern Territories as this buffer zone. Of course, Mexico no longer view, has this policy. Mexico does not share this policy view and instead deems that it wants to populate it. Now, under the new Mexican Constitution of 1824, established three years after Mexico officially gained its independence in 1821, the northern part of the northwestern, not northwestern, northeastern northern region becomes the Mexican province of Coelia and Tejas. Now, Tejas, of course, in translating into English, is Texas, or at least has been anglicized as that. So Coelia and Tejas are the two Mexican states, well, me well, I would say provinces would probably be more accurate. Provinces are established on the northeastern border of Texas, um, not Mexico, Mexico's border with the United States. Now, both of these provinces, both Coelia and Tejas, are very sparsely populated from the Spanish days and the Mexicans are dominated in these areas by the Apache and Comanche peoples. They are outnumbered by the Native American tribes. Now, since the many Mexicans didn't exactly wish to settle in these barren lands up in Coelia and Tejas, where the Native Americans were running wild and doing raids almost every day, not too many Mexicans were enticed about the prospect of moving up north. They deemed it as this is the wild wilderness. Why on God's earth would I move out there? <laughs> When I am settled, maybe perhaps right here in Mexico City, where there is a lovely society and it's a metropolis almost, and there's no people, no no Native Americans are coming to raid this town. I'm relatively safe compared to going up there to the wilds. So Mexican government realizes that the majority of their people really don't have that much of a motivation to move up north to these barren barren wilderness states. I do apologize. I've been reading a book lately, and I've had to read stuttering words when I read the book, because that is how it's written in the book, and whenever I read it, I actually end up stuttering. <laughs> so I do apologize. <laughs> now, since the Mexicans can't really, uh, what would be the word here, convince their own people to move to these northern states, they resort to another method to get these state northern areas populated, and that is they entice immigration they in they actually will they how would it be uh, how would it be here i'm trying to think of the right word there is a word here that, no that wouldn't be it not desire but uh oh come on it's like right on the tip of my tongue i don't know <laughs> Basically, they try to convince immigrants to settle in these areas, I guess we'll put it that way. And the Mexicans do this by inviting American settlers to settle in these two states. They invite American settlers from the United States right on the border as the state of Tejas and Coelia border the Louisiana Territory of the United States, and they border the states of Arkansas and Louisiana. Now... Americans are all for its free land, but the Mexicans even entice them further by doing a couple more things. They say that anyone who settles in these new lands that the Mex Mexicans have, that they want settled, any settlers and immigrants who come to settle in these lands will be exempt from certain tariffs and taxes for seven years. Basically, tax-free life, I don't gotta pay tariffs on what I sell, hot dog. And Mexico even made a exemption to entice more American settlers since they were bordering the American South. The American South had slavery. Now, Mexico itself had outlawed slavery in 1829, about roughly eight years after it was founded. founded. However, by the early 1830s, when this is going on and they start inviting American settlers, Mexico makes an exemption that any American settler who owns slaves could continue to use that enslaved labor in these Mexican provinces, even though slavery as a whole was outlawed in the rest of Mexico. But if you were an American immigrant who was coming across the border to settle and you had slaves, well, 
no, we don't got no problem as long as you live here. So this is kind of come ends up being the backfire of Mexico because the promises that they make to the American settlers, no t tax and tariff exemptions, you get to have your own slaves, even though we've outlawed it elsewhere. These kind of, they do entice American settlers to come in hordes and settle these territories. But at the same time, Mexico has also made a promise that at some point it's going to have to rescind. And when it rescinds it, Americans don't like that too much even though we have done it dozens of times to other people. So this brings us to 1832 to 1833, and what we know as the Anahuac, Anahuac Conventions. In 1830, the Mexican government forbid any further settlement in Texas, or which we'll call Tejas, Texas now, in Texas and Coelia, by any by Americans in particular, and it reimposed the suspended tariff that it had, led, had an exemption for its settlers in this area for seven years. Now, Mexicans, why did they do this all of a sudden? Well, they were becoming, they're after they had kind of offered these concessions to settlers that would settle in these areas, Americans came across the Mexican-U.S. border in droves to settle in these areas. They actually began to outnumber the local, Tex local Mexicans in these provinces. So, basically, they're becoming American provinces but they're still under official Mexican rule. Well, Mexico's government starts to realize this, and they grow fearful. They're growing very wary of the large number of immigrants settling these provinces from the U.S. They're trying to basically decide where do their loyalties lie. Do they lie with us, the Mexican state, or do they still lie with the United States, who might try to take away these provinces from us on the grounds that they're settled by American citizens? Now, over the following two years, Texans near what is now Houston, I think we all know where Houston is, they came into conflict with the Mexican government officials and the military as they tried to enforce the tariff and prevent the smuggling and immigration. Well, the people in Texas weren't really that happy about the end of the tariff suspension, and they weren't really that happy about no further Americans that could come across the border and settle in Texas. They really wanted more of their people, and they really wanted that tax and tariff exemption. So they really weren't very cooperative with the local Mexican government officials that came to actually enforce these laws and regulations. Now, the two sides eventually actually had a skirmish together at the battle of what is called the Battle of Velasco in June of 1832, and it forced all the Mexican garrisons in Texas to be abandoned except in Goliad and San Antonio. San Antonio. Basically, through a revolt that ends up occurring against the Mexican army due to the Texan anger against these end of these restrictions and suspensions, the Texans actually force most of the Mexican army that is stationed there, at least in Texas, to leave in 1832. Now, in Mexico itself, Mexico really didn't pay much attention to what was going on at North, nor could they really afford to, as Santa Ana... Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana was raging a war in Mexico, a rebellion of sorts, against the current president, which the Texans saw was a distraction to the Mexican government, that they wouldn't really interfere in Texas when they were too busy trying to solve a problem down south near the capital, and they used Santa Ana's rebellion as a excuse of sorts to legitimize their actions against the Mexican government, claiming that they were doing it on Santa Ana's behalf. Now, in 1832 and 1833, Texan colonists did held, held, hold conventions in which they petitioned the Mexican government for the exclusion of the extension of the tariff exemption. They wanted the tariff extension exemption to be extended past the seven-year limit that had just been abolished, and they wanted to repeal the wanted them to appeal, repeal the Anglo-American immigration ban. Now. A Texan named Stephen Austin was mostly the leader of this, and he was the one that actually presented the request to the government in Mexico City. Now, the immigration ban was agreed to be repealed by the Mexican government. They agreed to repeal the immigration ban, but the other demands were ignored, particularly the tax and tariff exemptions. When Austin wrote a letter advising Texans to ignore the government's response, even though they had said that yeah, we'll be willing to let you immigrate, but you're not getting exempt from those tariffs and taxes. 
when Austin wrote a letter back home to Texans to ignore the government's response, he was in, which it was intercepted by officials, and Austin actually ended up being put in prison for 18 months due to supposed sedition against the Mexican government by encouraging the citizens of a province to basically defy the federal government. This brings it to a point where it's getting close to revolution. The Texans are still angry that Mexico is not reinstating the earlier terms of settlement. And Mexico is getting quite agitated that these Americans just think they're going to come into Texas's, into Texas, come into Mexican territory and basically call the shots and basically never have to pay a dime. They're getting quite agitated that the te Texan colonists are really even rebelling because they deem it's a stupid reason. This brings us to the revolution phase. Santa Ana eventually wins his rebellion against the president of Mexico, and he becomes a dictator when he t officially takes power and gave power to the aristocracy of Mexico. He takes away power from the, pu from the public. He gives it to the aristocracy, the rich, the elites. And in his... And in his seven lanes in 1836, he introduces a new constitution for Mexico, which replaces the 1824 constitution. So under Santa Ana in 1836, he abolishes the old constitution that has served Mexico since its founding, that is now 12 years old. He abolishes that constitution and writes his own that basically gives power to the authoritarian elite in this aristocracy and makes him a dictator. Far from a president. Now, Santa Ana was not afraid to use force against those in Mexico that were dare defy him, as he demonstrated in Zacate Zacatecas in 1835 to violently, violently suppress a revol revolt there. In September of 1835, believing that the United States had plans on acquiring Texas, which it was actually starting to have, Santa Ana sent about a army a troops of about 300 to 500 troops to San Antonio in Texas in order to reassert government control in the province. Now, when the troops moved on the town of Gonzales to retake a cannon that had been given to the town for defense against Indian attacks, they were halted at the Guadalupe River by 18 militiamen, who, which then eventually grew to a number of over 500,000. Basically, this is very similar, in a way, to the battles of Lexington and Concord, at least the, the uh, preceding actions were. In the battles of Lexington and Concord, the British were marching to Lexington and Concord to seed, seize arms and munitions that the colonists had kind of stockpiled in those two towns. In the town of Gonzales, the Mexican army... The troop, even though it's only three or five hundred strong, it's still Mex it's still regiment troops of the Mexican army. They are marching into the town to seize arms, or in this case, a cannon that had been given to the local people to defend against Indian attacks. But now they deem that they're going to probably turn it on the Mexican army, so they we're, we're going to confiscate it from you. Well, in response, just like in Lexington Concord in America, roughly fifty or sixty years earlier, maybe even seventy. Well, let me think here. Yeah, about 70-some years earlier, if we really think about it, these men get, get their guns, get their arms, and go out to meet the ar invading army, these militiamen, to oppose it. They don't want to give up their arms. They don't want to give up the can guns. Anyway, this is very relevant to American society today. I mean, since when have Americans ever liked the idea of giving up their guns? For some reason, they still can't stand the idea. Why, I don't know, but who knows. So, eventually, the militiamen, initially, the number is 18, opposing a force of about 300 to 500 Mexican army troops. Eventually, this force actually, of militiamen actually swells to over 500. So, soon, they, out, they actually outnumber the Mexican army. That is, at the town of Gonzales. Militia taught the Mexicans, while they're facing them at Gonzales, to come and take it. Come and take the cannon. Come try. You'll regret that you ever did, as they're holding their guns. Basically trying to entice the Mexicans to, come on, come on, bring it on. Bring it on. Attack us. Attack us already. And on October 2nd, the two sides actually end up in a skirmish in what is commonly referred to as the Battle of Gonzales. 
Now, the Mexicans end up losing to the militia, which they were outnumbered in the first place, and they retreat back to San Antonio, which had begun the Texas Revolution. The Texans are now in open revolt against the Mexican army. Of course, this doesn't go over too well with the Mexican government. In October, of, in October, Stephen Austin begins a siege of San Antonio to push the Mexicans out of Texas once and for all, and over the following month wins several skirmishes around the city that eventually forces the Mexican supply lines to snap, and uh, thus the siege is able to be conducted immensely successfully. The Mexicans in the city of San Antonio no longer have their supply lines. They're cut off. They are trapped and encircled. And in December, the Mexicans eventually get split between the town and then the Alamo Mission on the outside of town. They're split into two groups because of the encirclement. The Texans attack fighting from building to building in San Antonio in late December and eventually force the Mexicans to surrender or withdraw south of the Rio Grande. So they pushed the Mexican army out of Texas. It seems that, oh, we've won. Mexicans are gone. We pushed out. Well, the Texas Revolution enraged Santa, Santa Ana, who is the dictator of Mexico at this by this time, and he calls the rebels pirates, and they they all deserve to be executed. He calls them all rebels. They're pi they're pirates. They're traitors. They are going to be executed and killed when I get a hold of them. Santa Ana personally takes charge of the Mexican response following the following the push out the retreat from San Antonio, and he personally leads an army of 7,000 troops across the Rio Grande in January of 1836 and moves on San Antonio to retake it. The Texan defenders, they make the Alamo mission somewhat of a fortress, and they then choose to fortify the compound with 150 men and 20 cannons, and among these men are Americans such as William Travis and James Bowie, the inventor of the Bowie knife. And the American frontiersman and former congressman Davy Crockett, who you may have heard of in your old little tall tales. Now, receiving only 30 more defenders, which brings their number to 180, you've got 180 men inside the Alamo that are opposing a Mexican army force of 7,000. I don't think they're going to win. And uh, on top of this, many of the men have women and children with them, their families that have traveled with them, and they are inside the Alamo as well. When Santa Ana arrives on February 23rd, he starts a siege of the Alamo that lasts until March 6th, over a week and a half. Santa Ana then uses... Oh, hold on here. Upon March 6th, they, the Alamo defenders actually fail. The Mexican army breaks into through the south gate, and they start slaughtering all the defenders inside, and eventually all of the Alamo defenders perish. They all get killed, except for some of the women and children and slaves who are allowed to leave after the battle. On March 2nd, a convention of Texans officially adopts a declaration of independence. The Texans are outraged by the massacre at the Alamo. They deem it as a massacre by the Mexican army, and they deem, okay, we're going to declare independence because it's apparent Mexico does not want to meet our demands, and it's apparent they're going to slaughter us just because we're opposing them on other on a argument ground. So we are going to declare independence because we're not being granted our fair rights. By March 17th, the Texans had a new constitution, officials elected, and an army was organized under the command of General Sam Houston, local Texan, who was a, basically a farmer. Now, and... Now, when the Mexican army reaches Goliad on March 27th, after marching from the San Antonio and the Alamo, they massacred 400 Texans in the town, causing further, in, further um, inflamed feelings between the Texans and the Mexicans. The Texans now want revenge against the Mexicans for, this, for the two massacres that they perceive at the Alamo and Goliad. Now, Houston and his army flee northeast with the civilians initially to escape and kind of regroup after the fall of Goliad to the Mexicans. They really can't afford to lose the Texas, Texan army at that time, so they safely retreated northeastward in order to keep it out of Santa, Hanna, Santa Ana's range. In April, the two sides end up meeting in a battle of Houston's pick 
near Lynch's Ferry on the San Jacinto River. On April 21st, the 900-man Texas Army attacks the surprise Mexican force. They kind of surprise them at dawn. Uh, and keep in mind, the Mexican force here is about 12 to 1,300. So they're fairly evenly matched here and made cries of, and while they're storming into battle, the Texans are literally yelling, remember the Alamo and remember Goliad. During the Battle of San Jacinto, it is over in 18 minutes. It is a complete rout of the Mexican army. The Mexican army is thrown entirely off its concentration and ends up retreating. And in the chaos, Santa Ana is slow to respond, and he actually ends up being captured while he's trying to flee. The Texans take him to Sam Houston, who actually happens to be resting under a tree because he had been wounded during the battle in the leg, and during... And Santa Ana agrees to order the Mexican army to retreat back across the Rio Grande, back into Mexico, as a prisoner of the Texans. And while he is prisoner, he signs the Treaty of Velas Velasco on May 14th, which officially recognizes Texan independence. It officially establishes a Republic of Texas and ends the war. However, there was also a secret clause in there where Santa Ana agreed that he would do everything that he possibly could to convince the Mexican government back at home to adhere to the treaty that he just signed with the Texans. Overall, at the Battle of San Jacinto, there were about 630 Mexicans killed, 730 of them taken prisoner, and nine Texans ended up killed. So in reality, if you take that into account, Prisoners and killed for the Mexicans, you have a total of one thousand three hundred and sixty casualties, and for the Texans, nine, nine out of nine out of nine hundred. So very big difference. The Texans just absolutely demolish the Mexicans at this short little battle. Now, although the, Tex the Republic of Texas is officially recognized in the Treaty of Alaska, which was signed by Santa Ana, the Mexican government refuses to acknowledge it. And they actually do this because during Santa Ana's imprisonment by the Texan army, he had actually been deposed in Mexico by his during his absence. The Mexican government actually throws out Santa Ana as this is their chance to get rid of the dictator while he's captured. And he is no longer typically considered the leader of Mexico. They also argue that because Santa Ana had been a prisoner at the time of the treaty signing and the negotiation of it, and since the Mexican government had never been a party of that negotiation, that the treaty is not valid, and that Texas is not, in fact, independent. It is simply a rebellious province. That is similar to how China views Taiwan today. So this sets the stage for the next 10 years where, although Texas is officially in technicality, it is independent from Mexico. It's officially its own nation, the Republic of Texas, also known as the Lone Star Republic because of the flag it adopted. It is not officially recognized by Mexico as being such, as Mexico claims that the treaty that officially supposedly creates it was invalid and not in any way a valid treaty. It is, has no, it is not effective. So they argue that because of the treaty's conditions under which it was signed and the fact that the man who signed it is no longer our leader, it no longer applies. Well, that's not really the case. And this sets the stage for 10 years of back and forth conflict where Texas says the treaty says its border is here. And Mexico, not even wanting to acknowledge Texas in the first place, is saying, no, your border is here. The Mexican, the Texans claim that their border was at the Rio Grande, while the Mexicans claim that their the Texan border was at the Nueces River, which was a little further to the north. Now, when the United States eventually annexes, annexes Mexico in 1846, they take up the Texan claim that the border is at the Rio Grande. The Mexicans still proclaim that it was never recognized as the Rio Grande, and in order to try to basically end the dispute, President Polk, James K. Polk, ends up sending troops into Mex into Texas to the Rio Grande, which is considered Mexican territory, and ends up sparking a war with the Mexico over that land and over the in Texas and the entire western United States, in which the United States easily came back on came out on top and won most of the western territories. And I did do a video on that. I think that was one of our first videos I ever did. 
So I will make sure to include a little link to that at the end of this video. So right here we have a couple of photos, little images that probably need to be going over. This is kind of a map of Texas during the Texas Revolution. Kind of shows you where the battles took place, where certain cities were. During that revolution, we can see it's San Antonio in the Alamo. I'm pretty sure most people know of the Alamo mission or have heard of it. You can go still go see it in San Antonio today. It's still there. It would have been right here. And go up here. And then San Jacinto was closer. Right here, this is the Louisiana border with the United States. So San Jacinto really didn't happen that far from the U.S. border. And then as a further thing here, as we can kind of see, right here is the Rio Grande. The Rio Grande River, which today forms the southern border of Texas. But the Mexicans were claiming that this was not the border. That the border was the Nueces River right here, further to the north. That this whole bottom triangle was not Texan land. Here we have an image of General of General Antonio de Sa Lopez de Santa Ana, who was the dictator of Mexico during this time, and technically president of Mexico. I mean, you could say that. Here we have an image of Sam Houston who really was a founder for Texas's Republic and became one of its, if, its first governor upon it becoming admitted to the United States as a state in 1845. And ironically, for Sam Houston, when he was still the governor of Texas when the Civil War broke out, now as we all know, Texas broke away with the Confederates. Well, Houston refused to secede from the United States. He did not support the secessionist movement, and he dictated that I will not sign that secession document. In response, the Texas legislature removes him from power, forces him to resign, and basically overrules their own founder because they wanted to keep slavery. Here we have an image, a painting of the Battle of the Alamo. This is the moment, supposed to be a depiction of the moment when the Mexican army broke through the South Gate, which is when they, on March 6th, when they finally started to overtake the Alamo defenders. And we have kind of a depiction of Congressman Davy Crockett here. He did die, as all the men, male defenders did, just kind of taking his rifle and he's getting ready to swing it on one of the incoming Mexican soldiers that is storming into the gate. And then here I have an image of Santa Ana surrendering to Sam Houston after, just after the Battle of San Jacinto, after that 18 minutes where he had just been captured. We can see Santa Ana is kind of standing right here while Sam Houston is the one lying down with the injured leg. And it was under a tree. And finally, we got a map here of what, after the Texas Revolution, of what the map is supposedly looking like and what the political situation is in the American Southwest at this point. Or the United States still is up here. Louisiana Territory, Arkansas, Louisiana. The Republic of Texas only ever did not include all of Texas. Officially, it only was this white section here. This was officially the Republic of Texas. Had their own navy, had their own constitution, had their own president, had their own house, had their own senate, had a whole government, republic government, Republican government set up. Down here is Mexico. All this area right here is territory that Texas and Mexico were disputing on. Texas claimed that all this was part of it. This would have been the state of Coelia, and that this was part of Tejas. It was conjoined, so they argue that since we're independent, so was that area. And that's part of our territory. Mexico says, no, no, it's not. You aren't even independent, supposed to be independent anyway. So that was largely the political situation up until 1846, when the Mexican-American War breaks out, and the U.S. government and the Mexican government kind of go at it. So that kind of concludes that little video. It was a very, sh the Texas Revolution is not exactly a long revolution. It's not really massive. But the fact that most people really don't know that Texas was its own state for a while, was, was its own country for a while, 
is fairly significant to me, and I deem that that was why I wanted to kind of touch upon that. And because I had touched upon the Mexican-American War before, but I never really touched upon the question of Texas at all. So I just wanted to go ahead and hit that. So for our next video, it's either going to be on the 8th President of the United States. It's either going to be on Martin Van Buren or it's going to be on the Ohio Indian Wars. I'm still deciding which one I want to do first. And I should have that up. If not this weekend, then I will have that up sometime next week. So I think that concludes for right now. Yeah, it does. So that concludes our little video today. I know it was not really super long, but I felt it was something that needed to be discussed. So that kind of concludes for today's video. So as always, if you have any suggestions at all, feel free at any time to leave a comment down in one of the videos. I, I'm happy to take suggested videos, suggested discussion topics, as that would probably be tremendous if we actually had a suggestion at one point or another. That's because that tells me that there's a topic that people actually want to hear about themselves and not just one that I named off out of the top of my head and not everyone really has any interest in it. But if you ever have any suggestion, be feel free to put that down in one of the comments in one of our videos. So... Other than that, as always, like, subscribe if you've been watching the videos. If you find yourself coming back and watching more of these as a reference or something of that sort, be sure to do that. Be sure to subscribe. That way you are notified when there are more coming out, as there will be more coming out. Now we're finally trying to get back into the groove of things here. So, as always, like, subscribe, any suggestions, comments, put them down below. So, that concludes our little video for today. So... Hopefully everyone remains safe and well during this COVID-19 pandemic. I understand how thing, the political climate is right now, but I must say I do support the vaccinations. I myself did get the two vaccinations that I was required to get, uh, the type that I had. I think it was the Pfizer. So I can tell you this from right now, if anyone is fearing that they're going to have side effects or something of that sort, I had mine back in... I had my vaccinations back in March and April, and I have not had any side effects since. The only side effect I had in the immediate aftermath of getting it was a sore arm, and that was only for like a day or two, and I've had that with other vaccinations I've got, so really, there was no side effects at all. So, I can tell you this right now. If you're not wanting to get the vaccine over the side effects, I think your fear is a little bit exaggerated. You don't have as much to fear on that as you would think. So I do encourage that if you're kind of on that borderline where you want to get it, I do encourage you to get it as it would probably help to end this pandemic a whole lot quicker. If you don't, that's your choice. That's your decision. So as always, hopefully everyone continues to do well, and we will hopefully see you all back here next week. So may God, may, all, may you all have a good rest of your week, and may God bless you all.